My name is Stefan. I am a senior software engineer at TTP Games, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we defend our players from hackers and how we have evolved account security in Evil Divine. Are any new players in here? Okay, a couple. All right. Uh, I'm going to begin this talk with a very good philosophical quote. Uh, Internet spaceships is serious business. Um, this is something that every serious EVE player ever has said at some point in time. To sort of give you the context of what I'm going to be talking about, I need to tell you a little bit about EVE Online and what it is. So EVE Online is a sandbox MMO. Uh, our players can pretty much decide by themselves what they want to do. They can, be, they can be miners, they can be pirates, they can be mercenaries, industrialists. We, like, we even have like the the spaceship equivalent of a truck driver. Uh, and the economy in EVE is entirely player driven. So most of the items within the game, like spaceships, stations, ammunition, weapons, these are usually manufactured by players and sold by players and of course bought by players. EVE is very PvP centric. Uh, it basically thrives on PvP battles taking place. Uh, it sort of keeps the economy going sort of like the real world, unfortunately. Uh, but EVE also has a very high risk versus reward factor. So basically, the more you risk, usually within the game, the more you stand to gain. But EVE is also special in that sense that you also stand to lose a lot more because EVE can actually permanently destroy your items. Now, players create and join corporations to play together. Uh, if you've ever played World of Warcraft, Corporations are pretty much the equivalent of guilds. But EVE sort of takes this a step further as well by creating what they call alliances. And corporations form alliances for large-scale warfare, like to control constellations or control entire solar systems. Some facts about EVE Online. Um, EVE is 16 years old. It launched in May 2003, and there are a lot of, not a lot of MMOs that last this long. And it is a single shard universe. So everyone that plays EVE is playing on the same server. We do not split EVE up by regions. That gives us the benefit of having usually around 25,000 players locked in at any given moment. And because we have so many players, uh, EVE actually holds the current Guinness World Record for the single biggest PvP battle in an online game ever, where 6,142 players fought over uh, an internet space station. Um, this battle took hours. And EVE has sort of also made headline news. Uh, you can actually Google this. It's not an easy name to remember, but it's called the bloodbath of the R5RB. The R5RB is the name of a solar system within the game, where the equivalent of $300,000 $300, worth of assets were destroyed. But Back to the point of this talk, why do EVE players get hacked? There are, there's mainly just one reason they get hacked, and that's RMT, real money trading. Real money trading is usually frowned upon in, e in online games, but understandably, it's something that players resort to, because like a new player might want to sort of like get a head start in the game, so they go to a very shady website and they decide to buy sort of the in-game currency for maybe $30 or whatever. And this is what fuels account hacking. This is possible because almost everything within the game can be bought or sold on the in-game market. And because of this, and also another reason, ISK, which is the in-game currency, can be directly transferred between accounts. And this gives us a mechanism to basically liquidate accounts. So that's why they get hacked. Um, but how do they operate? Well, we sort of looked at their behavior, what they do, and they build account lists. And they do this through several methods. One of them is credential stuffing attacks. I'm gonna go into more details on those later. You've also seen uh, key loggers, where like, they tempt players with for example, a bot that can be automated, that can help you mine in the game, but usually, like, usually it's just a very well disguised keylogger. And they also do phishing attempts. We don't see many of those, but they happen from time to time. 
but when the accounts get hacked, they don't liquidate them immediately. They, that's why they build up these account lists. The RMTers or the hackers, they usually wait for purchase orders to come in, like some player wants to buy in-game currency, and it's only then that they start locking into the accounts, acting on demand, and liquidating them. So they go through the list that they have until they've gathered enough resources to basically fulfill their purchase order. But that's not the only thing they do. They also take advantages of like uh, payment loopholes or reward loopholes. For example, we've had like reward systems in the game uh, where if you sort of you invite maybe ten of your friends to start playing, if five of them become subscribers, we give you like a reward as a thank you for getting more players into the game. They tend to abuse this. Uh, they invite themselves maybe ten times, and then they use a stolen credit card to pay for it, run away with the rewards, and of course the credit cards get charged back. But we've also seen them create bots, and this has sort of been a problem over the years, which we're constantly trying to like mitigate or do something about, where they create automated bots to maybe automate mining or automate some marketing transfers. And of course, that's not providing any value into the game, so we want to get rid of those. But my experience with all of this was by getting thrown into the deep end. I started working at CCP in May 2008, uh, very conveniently because I used to work at a bank. And in October 2008, pretty much all the banks in Iceland went under. So that was a very good time to go somewhere else. Um, and I joined the, like, the first project I worked on was the billing and account management project. So very, very soon after I started, I very got a very harsh introduction to scripted attack and credit card frauds. And I think it was, I think it was maybe just about a week after I started that I saw like the first big credential stuffing attack. And it was, it was sort of eye-opening for me at the time. I'd never like had any experience in dealing with this. Uh, so basically what a credential stuffing attack is, uh, you go through a user pass list, which you can get in a lot of places. You can patch them on the dark web, torrent sites. And then you create some sort of a bot or a script that just basically goes through that list, submits it to a login page, and you see what sticks. Now, this is amazingly successful if there's no login throttling, unfortunately, which was the case when I started working. Like the web department at CCP was, had just recently been formed, so there wasn't a lot of knowledge at the time. But the primary reason for this being so successful is because people reuse passwords. Uh, we all know that's bad. We still do it though, uh, a lot of us at least. So what can we do? So like I said, there was a really big attack shortly after I joined. And it was, it was sort of eye-opening to see this happen because we saw, we saw these hackers go through like hundreds of thousands of usernames and passwords and there was nothing to stop them at all. Uh, and of course, we saw that several thousand accounts like matched where the usernames and passwords matched. But we were pretty lucky because a vast majority of those accounts uh, were not active subscribers, so they couldn't log in anyway. They were like, I think it was just a handful of accounts that were actual subscribers they of course got notified and had their passwords reset and everything. Uh, so, but we figured like we got to do something about this. Um, so, we started thinking like if only there was some extra info that we could validate the users with. So, we did the poor man's 2FA, a character challenge. The reason we didn't do a proper 2FA at that time was basically because it didn't exist. Uh, Google Authenticator didn't exist until 2010, and sort of the standardized version of uh, like one-time generated password wasn't like I think it wasn't ratified as an RFC until 2011. But we thought like, is there something that only the account owner knows that we can use? And of course, we figured out let's just ask the users to give us a name of a character on their account, and. This is what it looked like. It's a bit of a blurry screenshot. I'm just gonna read it for you. It's the best that I could find. It says, since you haven't logged in from this IP before, we based this on IP address, uh, please enter the name of one of the characters associated with your account. So of course, this is something that usually only the players themselves would know. But 
this, of course, wasn't perfect. So let's go through character challenge or convention 101. And yet, like, if you were a hacker, what would be the first thing that you would try if you saw this prompt? Any ideas? Sorry? Yeah, but like, what would you use if you got the prompt? What would you type into it? Correct. Try to use the login username as the character name. And that worked a lot of the time. Social engineering, get customer support to tell you. This one's interesting. We, we made a little mistake when we actually pushed this feature out. Um, we forgot to tell customer support. So <laughs> they were not aware that this was information that they were not supposed to give out. But of course, like we, we went over that and we got process in place to prevent that from happening. So social engineering, get the actual owner to tell you. Um, we saw a lot of cases where they basically just try to use the same username at gmail.com and see what sticks. Send them, hey, we're contacting you from CCP customer support. Like, do you think your account might be a part of like some hacker group? So what's the name of your character? So we can like clear you off our list of suspects, whatever, that this works. But the character challenge, it wasn't perfect, but it did reduce account takeovers. So it, like it did, it did something. It wasn't, it wasn't the best user experience, but we thought that we should, okay, we need to do something more. So shortly after, CCP creates Plex. Plex stands for Pilot License Extension. And the objective was reduce the demand and return on investment for RMT. And what's the best way to do that? Basically provide the same service that they do. But we didn't want to start creating like in-game currency out of thin air, so we had to have something to counterbalance that. So we created an in-game item that the players could trade between themselves, but this item needed to somehow have real world value. Um, but how do you get real world value into a virtual game? We decided that Plex can be consumed to extend your subscription. So basically you pay for someone else's subscription and he gives you in-game currency instead, right? Problem solved. So we managed to keep the value within the game uh, so it was an economy-friendly way for a new player to get ISK, the in-game currency, without us having to like deflate the value of everything by creating the currency out of thin air. Uh, and you would, could basically, like today, if you are a very active player and you're very good at gathering ISK, you can basically play for free by basically buying plexes of other players that have bought them off our account website. But, of course, this worked. Like RMT prices went up, account occupants down, but we still weren't happy with everything. But like some time passed, and we we started we started like getting more systems in place. So we introduced the Eve single sign-on, and we needed to do this because, like I said, we added a lot of systems. Uh, so they required auth. So instead of us having to like duplicate all of the author authentication mechanisms all over the place. We figured we'd just create a single sign-on. We, like, we needed to funnel them. That was, that was the primary objective. So we decided to base it on OAuth 2, which was still in a draft stage at that point. For those of you that maybe don't know what OAuth 2 is, if you ever played a game or gone to a website that says login with Facebook, you click a button, it redirects you to Facebook. Facebook asks, right, would you want this application to get permission to your data? That's an OAuth 2 authorization flow you're going through right there. So we decided, okay, this is a, this makes sense to like delegate permissions. So let's do this. Unfortunately, a very few stable implementation existed at that point. So we wrote our own. And I can probably some people see some people squirming in there because one does not simply write your own auth. But like we, we didn't really have much of a choice at that time, so we went for it. When it was actually in a ready-to-use state, we needed to get everyone to integrate with it because it's useless if no one uses it. So all of our systems, like we had account management systems, uh, customer support systems, they all belonged to different teams and even different departments within the company. So we had to sort of push for a company-wide effort to integrate them. And thankfully, we, we 
really got sort of a, the support from the company that we needed. So we pretty much got everything on board that we had at the time. That was like account management, forums, game launcher, third party APIs, customer support system, et cetera, et cetera. And now we also had something to use for new systems to plug into. So the benefits of this were immediate, really, uh, once we had this integrated. Uh, we had one place to focus our security work on. We had a much faster time to delivery on security features. And the OAuth process gives us something that we can use to revoke tokens. So like if a user changes his password or resets his password, we can basically re revoke all of his tokens and he gets automatically logged out of every other system he's logged into. So like it was a, there was a big problem solver just right there. And now we really were able to start working on these security features. So one of the first things we did was improve our login throttling because our first attempt was pretty primitive. Like we needed to throttle something, but like having off distributed over different applications was not really, not a convenient way to do this. So we were able to like move to a shared counter, use a distributed cache to like, so all of the login attempts are using the same thing. Uh, we were able to sort of also base them on IPs of geolocations so as to not basically block everyone or just be able to do this intelligently. And we were able to sort of tweak it to success ratios as well. Uh, we thought that we'd, well, we figured out when we were doing this that we could also like start recording known locations or like safe IPs for people because we had the character challenge at the time, but getting that challenge every time you were logging in was annoying. So like if you successfully finished that challenge, we would be able to like record the IP address uh, based on the geolocation for the user or the IP. But so we wouldn't prevent you with the character challenge again, but if you like came from a new IP or geolocation, you would get the character challenge. So we fast forward, like this is all getting better. We fast forward to 2015 where we actually really drew proper 2FA, which was an obvious replacement for the character challenge. We decided to use email as fallback because we had people's email addresses in many cases, not all. Uh, we simply didn't have the manpower to do, for example, SMS authentication. Like so we would have to like create a whole new process around around people giving us phone numbers and stuff. We decided to just use this. So it was still cumbersome for players with many accounts because they're still getting around them. And that's actually a, a point that I haven't mentioned before. These players tend to have more than one account. We actually have large scale players that have like tens of accounts. So obviously getting prompted for every single one of them when you're logging in is annoying. So the adoption was pretty low. Uh, the reason being that like people in general tend to not enable two-factor authentication. And when we were in a situation where our power users weren't, weren't even using it, there was like, there was no real incentive for other people to use it. So in 2016, Eve goes free to play. And that was, that was interesting. Uh, because of course what free to play means is a subscription is no longer required. We thought, okay, that's good. Like, those who are not non-subscribers have access to a new set of features. But what does that mean for account security? Of course, if you think about it, that means uh, that you don't have to be a subscriber anymore. So if we think back, remember the accounts that were credentials of years ago but we didn't think about because they were disabled anyway? See the problem here, right? Now they can all log in again. So, this was not optimal. Um, and we started thinking a little bit more about like, what about credential stuffing attacks that we might have missed? Like even if we had login throttling in place, that can be circumvented. You basically just slow down your credential stuffing attack or distribute it. So there were, were probably some st credential stuffing attacks that we missed. And of course, this puts us in a situation that we need to solve this somehow. And this is hard without a big impact on user experience. So we were, we knew that we would have to impact user experience in some way. Like we seriously thought about, should we just reset the password for everyone? Uh, when you're 
re-releasing a game as a free to play, that's really not a good idea. You want people to be able to log in. You don't want them to go through hoops. And also, like, we figured that credential stuffed accounts were probably a very small fraction of the actual number of accounts in there. So we started coming up with solutions. Um, one of the first one we sort of decided upon, and it was, it was obvious when we figured it out, was let's just do what Steam does. Like, Steam, like everybody knows what Steam is. Almost people know what Steam is. Like the biggest game distribution platform on PC. And they have this feature called Steam Guard. So they, if, if they see you logging in from a new device or a new location, they give you a prompt. And that prompt says, we have sent you an email address with a verification code. You need to type in that verification code to continue logging in. So we figured, okay, that's a good solution since they're using it. What do we have to do? Step one, demand users have a verified email address. This wasn't required before. Like we had an email verification process in place but it was not required to actually play the game. So we had to block people from logging in until they had verified their addresses. This, like, again, not optimal, but this was sort of the best solution we, we figured at the time. We needed to clear the list of safe IPs because we had our doubts that it was reliable. Like, if there was a successful credential stuffing attack that we might have missed, for some reason, like we could have marked a lot of IPs as being safe when they really weren't, so we just decided to nuke that list. Step three, send two-factor authentication verification codes when people are logging in and build up a new safe IP list for users and set a device cookie to like, we, because we don't want to do this every time people are logging in. And this is what it looks like. Uh, we still do this today. It's very similar. It basically says, please enter the verification code. We just sent your email address. If you do not receive the email within 30 minutes, please contact customer support. And we spent a heap of time like iterating on this process, iterating on the flow, and making sure that this worked for our users. Um, so what could go wrong? Like we fixed all the bugs. We made the flow really nice. Uh, there is when we thought like we should have figured this out, but we didn't, um, there was a big change in email sending behavior. We started sending both verification emails and emails with verification codes, and because we nuked the list of safe IPs, we started sending out a lot of these. And the email services tend to find that suspicious. So they are all, all of a sudden, they're seeing like, hey, CCP is sending like a lot more emails than they're used to sending. What should we do? They figured out what they should do. Delay the emails for up to 48 hours. When you have a verification code that expires in 30 minutes, you can, you can see how that's not gonna work. Uh, so we, we panicked. We like contact them, say, what should we do? And they, we pretty much got the same response from everyone. Uh, sorry, you're gonna have to wait. And we like, what do you mean by wait? Because they said basically like, you have to wait for our heuristics to accept this new behavior, and this took time. This took about two weeks to get back to normal. Otherwise, like sometimes the emails just went to the spam folder, sometimes they just didn't arrive until after 48 hours. So we had to, we had to scramble, like we, we really had to create manual workarounds for customer support, but like it worked in the end. So what worked? The increase in account takeovers was absolutely minimal compared to the increase in logins. And this was not just because people couldn't log in. Uh, this was like, this was when people actually started being able to log in. There wasn't an increase in account takeovers, which we were really happy with because we were seeing like a huge spike in logins because now everyone could log in again. And an added benefit of all this was that we now had validated emails for all of our active players. And this, this is a huge deal for customer support because it's hard to help someone when you don't even have an email address to contact them in case something goes wrong. And this was sort of a, an added benefit out of all this, out of this exercise. We also went ahead and hardened our email change process because we had seen numerous times where people maybe forgot to log out of their computer or were at a public computer Someone went in, changed the email address, reset the password, and basically taken over the account. So what we currently do is, so yeah, objective, of course, prevent account takeovers. 
So what we currently do is we require verification on both ends to persist the email address change. This is, this is a bit heavy handed. We weren't sure how this would go down with our users, but like, the increase in customer support was absolutely minimal. But then we get to the good stuff. You've all seen this, I think. Most of you have seen this. Uh, Troy Hunt, you know who he is. He talked about this on Wednesday. What he didn't talk about is another feature that have I been pwned has, which is called pwned passwords. And this is an API that he provides that allows you to check to see if a password has been part of a data breach. And just to basically read up what it says, it says pwned passwords are over 555 million real world passwords previously exposed in data breaches. This exposure makes them unsuitable for ongoing use as they're at much greater risk of being used to take over other accounts. Seems like a perfect fit, right? So that's what we did. We integrated Have I Been Pwned with our SSO in May 2018. And as a result of this, uh, or basically, let me go over how we do this. The password has it checked on login using K anonymity. Uh, K anonymity works in a way that we do not provide the entire hash to the service just so the service can't track it. For example, if you use this password, don't use it, by the way, it's bad. You take the SHA-1 hash of this password, you get this hash. And note the blue and green parts. The blue part is the only part of the hash that we actually send over to the service. So we do a get request to this URL with the blue part. We get back a response, a line limited response, of matching suffixes, the green parts. And in this case, we get over 500 of them. So we look over that list, and if we find the green part in that list, then we know that this password has been pwned. And this is the reason you shouldn't use this password, because it has appeared over 52,000 times in data breaches. So I suggest if you actually have this password, go and change it. So if the hash matches, we notify the user that his password is insecure, but there's a catch here. How you do this really matters because you do not want the users to panic. Like, if you just say, like, your password's been hacked, then what people think is like, okay, who hacked your website? That's not the impression that you want to give people, so you want to explain what's going on. So we do this by displaying this prompt here. We basically try to explain to the user what's going on. For example, what has my account been compromised? Uh, probably not. We don't want to say no because we're not entirely sure. But this increases the risk of your account being compromised because your current password appears at least once on a list of commonly known passwords. So what should I do? To keep your account secure, we highly recommend that you log into the account management website, change your password, and enable two-factor authentication. And then we give also people like a list to help them educate themselves on password practices. Uh, and we also explain that we do, not, we do not, for example, store their password. We can't see what it is until they provide it to us. That's why we do this on the login page, because of course we're not storing the passwords in clear text. And we explain to the user that CCB does not and cannot and does not share the actual password with anyone. So, what, what's the result of this? When we pushed this out, 17 to 19% of logins had insecure passwords. I'm a bit of a pessimist. I actually thought that this percentage would be higher than it is. Uh, but now, like almost one and a half year later, this currently fluctuates around nine to 12%. So you can already see the improvement here. This is basically around a 40% reduction in unsecured passwords which is good for everyone, right? So to give you an example of the scale of this, last September we had 245,000 unique username password logins. Before Have I Been Pwned integration, that would mean that around 40,000 of those logins would have been using a bad password. After, we can say that at most 30,000 are using it, so we basically have saved 10,000 10, accounts from using an insecure password just for the month of September, or a period of one month. After this um, exercise, we figured, all right, 
and let's have some security training. So that's what it did. Incidentally, that security training happened to be Troy Hunt's workshop. I highly recommend it, it's very good. So we started using sort of the built-in browser features, security features that they have. Uh, Troy talked about uh, some of those on Wednesday as well. For example, the content security policies, where we are basically able to whitelist JavaScript images and CSS that's allowed to run on our websites, or at least our account management or, or SSO. We are also able to whitelist URLs for network requests. You can actually tell the browser which URLs he's allowed to contact with AJAX requests. So you can actually use a content security policy to prevent hackers from exfiltrating data by sending it through requests to other websites. We used HSTS, Strict Transport Security. That's another HTTP header. It instructs browsers to only ever load a website over HTTPS for a certain period of time. And what we get by this is that even if we have like links on our website that maybe accidentally have HTTP in them, the browser will simply just convert that over HTTPS and it just works, as long as you have a certificate, of course. But this also allowed us to take advantage of the HSTS preload list. And what's that? That's a list that you can actually submit your domain to. And that list then gets built into browsers today. So most of the modern browsers that we have today actually have a big list of domains hard-coded to only ever load over HTTPS. So even if you type HTTP in the address bar, the browser will convert that to HTTPS before it even sends the first request. The port URI, Troy talked about this as well. Uh, he talked about, for example, in the case of CSP violations, we can see when the CSP is, been, is being violated. This can happen, for example, with plugins. But there are other benefits as well. For example, network errors, we can get a report as long as the network isn't down. For example, if the connection gets reset or gets disrupted for whatever reason, we can have the browsers tell us. We can also get deprecation warnings. And this is a really, really nice thing and it's getting more and more traction. If we're using a browser feature that's about to be deprecated, we can have the browsers tell us that, for example, like you're using a feature that will be deprecated in Chrome 82. So you can actually know ahead of time and actually do things like alerting. We decided to do more. Uh, we collaborated with 1Password because we figured we need to do more to educate our users. We need our users to have better like password policies. So we cooperated with them and like we are now able to give, for example, every player a free six month trial of 1Password. Like everyone should be using a password manager. It doesn't have to be 1Password, just use a password manager. We also went ahead and improved the two-fair experience. Like I said, we have players that have many accounts. Uh, and if you have 20 accounts, it's not really fun to scroll through 20 of them and find to find the correct authenticated login. So we allowed people to enable the sharing of the two-faced seed. It's a bit of a manual process, but people who know what it is can actually take advantage of it. So people can use the same seed for all their accounts. Of course, this is not as secure as using a separate one, but it's always better than not using it at all. So this is what we did. Simplification for people with multiple accounts. And this feature, we sort of launched this together with our one password collaboration to sort of build up a proper man momentum for all of this. And it increased adoption immediately of 2 fa And I have, I have some more statistics. Since Eve launched, this is like the percentage of all accounts in Eve have ever been created, a lot of them have never even logged into the game. 0.7% of them have two-factor authentication enabled. Since we introduced 2FA, that percentage, like, and then I'm talking about accounts that are logged, actually logged into the game since we launched 2FA, that percentage goes to 2.6%. As a result of the have a been pwn integration, where we actually try to educate our users and show them what they should do, and like go to change your password, use a enable two-factor authentication, et cetera, this immediately jumps to 5.6%, and that's from May 2018. After this, these changes, 
like improving the tooltech experience. Like we did a big blog about it. We did the one password collaboration. So over, for example, over the last three months, our users, like 9.7% of our logins are now using two-factor authentication. And this percentage is actually pretty high for the industry in general. One interesting thing about this, not on the slides though, is I looked up, for example, the last month instead of the last three months, and the percentage actually went down. And I thought, why is that? It became obvious when I looked at it because two of is usually not the first thing you do when you create an account. It's not the first thing you enable. So we sort of saw that people usually don't enable this until after about two weeks. We have a lot more ideas on how to improve this. We want to do more with two-factor authentication and we have some on the drawing board but I can't really commit to anything right now. So looking at all this, we can try to summarize this. Like, what, what have we learned out of all this? This is, this is 11 years on and off of trying to improve security, figuring out things, what to do. Providing a similar service to RMT helped a lot. And it helped a lot in a way that it actually surprised us how much it did at the time because we saw that the RMT websites had to raise their prices and we actually saw that for a certain period of time, they actually had trouble fulfilling their orders. Unfortunately, it had caught up in a lot of ways. So this is like a, it's like a constant battle. Verified email addresses are valuable for customer support. Look, this is obvious when you think about it, but not everyone realizes how useful it is. We were able to provide much better customer support as a result of this. Security training is important. And this, this is also a big one. Uh, we can all read about security features. We can all look them over, see how they work. But unless you actually try them out for yourselves, you usually don't realize that the impact, what impact they actually have. So sending developers to workshops or having them get proper security training is really important if you want to like build a culture around this. It's not enough that just one person's doing this. There are a lot of powerful free tools out there. Highlight Pin Pwned is one of them. Uh, the browser features that we've talked about are one of them. And these are features that don't cost anything. I mean, there's a, there's a small development cost involved, of course, to get this up and running. But once you've got this up and running, it's not really, it's not really all that expensive. I mean, there's no like yearly subscription that you have to pay for. Educate and guide users. This is really important as well, and I wish more companies actually did this because a lot of users, like probably all of us in here, we realize how passwords work. A lot of you probably have password managers. Hopefully, most of you have two-factor authentication enabled. If not, I want that to be the first thing you do when you walk out of this room. But we need to educate users on how to protect their accounts. It, it doesn't happen by itself. It's, it's all too often that users don't think about this until they've been hacked, and then it's usually too late. So educate and guide users. Encouraging and incentivizing 2FA is really important as well. You want people to enable this because today, this is the absolute best thing that you can do to prevent your accounts from being taken over. So if there was, if there was just like one thing that I'd want you to take out of this talk, it's this. Like, please tell your users to enable 2FA. If you have an opportunity to incentivize them in some way, please do that as well. Because this is the reason. It is the best way to prevent account takeovers. So that's pretty much all I have for now. Um, if you have any questions, ask away. If you can't think of any, you can contact me on Twitter when you do. So, any questions? Yep. How do we deal with disabling 2FA? Um, currently, we don't do much. We, we, of course, want people to keep it enabled. Um, 
a big part of this is incentivizing it in some way. Like we've seen companies, I think it's MailChimp, that actually give you a discount of your subscription fee if you have it enabled. So doing things like this is the best way to keep people from not disabling it. That's, it's tricky. Like you need to be able to, for example, verify that he is the actual account owner. And that in those cases, we actually have, we actually have game masters that can disable this manually. Some companies don't. Some companies simply say that you're out of luck if this happens. You just have to create a new account. Uh, recovery codes is one thing. Like GitHub and more people use recovery codes. We haven't implemented that yet, but that's on our drawing board for that very reason. Organized, very organized. <laughs> um, annoyingly organized. These are usually, they're usually related to companies that specialize in doing this. Um, like it was, it's very typical to call them Chinese farmers, but they're not Chinese anymore. They're from all over. So is there a certain demographic that's more vulnerable for like phishing attempts? I don't know. We haven't actually we haven't actually checked or like done any research on that. And prob sure, probably someone has, but it's it's an interesting question actually. Uh, so if, if anyone has information on it, it'd be good good to know. Yeah. Um. No, well, you can always try, but like in some places this simply isn't illegal. Uh, of course, as soon as they cross into the realm of using like stolen credit cards, then of course it becomes illegal very quickly. But it, it's, it's hard to deal with because they're like, just because of culture differences really. Uh, so we, we need to find other ways of fighting this. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>